Hey gamers, this is Liz Davidson from Beyond Solitaire, and I'm finally starting a tutorial series I've been wanting to do for a long time. This is going to be a series dedicated to Cuba Libre. This is a coin game. It's designed by Volker Runke and Jeff Grossman, and it is dedicated to Castro's insurgency in the late 1950s. This is an asymmetrical game where all four of the players have different goals, and it is meant to simulate uneven warfare, and we're going to have a deck of cards that's tied to real historical events. So this is gonna be really fun. Typically in the past, I have done kind of longer tutorial videos, but I think what I wanna do for this one is have a shorter set of videos that are together in a playlist. So this is definitely just the first of many videos. I'm definitely gonna make one for each faction. I wanna make some videos that bring the play-by-play -play from the rule books to life. And I definitely wanna show off those solo bots. So beyond that, we're gonna kind of see what I wanna do with the series, but I definitely wanna do several videos that I feel comprehensively teach this game bit by bit and make it very easy to digest. I chose uh, Cuba Libre as my first coin to cover in this way because it is the most accessible coin. Um, the board, as you can see, is a normal modest size. <laughs> the piece counts aren't too crazy. I really think a normal game group could easily get this game out and play it. You just have to be open to the fact that it's gonna feel a little funny at first because of those asymmetrical goals and asymmetrical abilities. But if you played Root, for example, you absolutely could play this, no problem. So I think what I wanna do is talk through who all of our factions are, what their pieces are, and kind of where they are on the board, and their goals. And in that way, hopefully, we'll be able to also talk through setup. So one of the best things about setup, by the way, is there are little clues on the board that tell you where things go. So for example, I need to put a yellow piece here because it's printed on the board. Yes. Uh, and that's true for every other area in here at setup. You're also gonna get information about who controls the space at the beginning of the game and what kind of support or opposition is in that space just by looking at the corners of the little boxes at setup. So I personally think that is wonderful. It makes it a lot harder to mess up your setup. But if you wanna double check everything, there's also nice little piece counts in the available forces boxes here. So you know what needs to be out on the entire board so you can count your pieces, make sure you're looking good. And there's a nice little succinct description of where everything should go on the very back page of the rule book. So you can actually just go down the list and you will be just fine. But in any case, this is what the standard setup looks like. There is also a variable setup that you could choose to try, but this is like the historical setup that is meant to mirror what was actually happening at the time of the start of the game. So let's go ahead and talk through our factions and look at their pieces on the board. And I think that'll be a good kind of intro for us. So our first faction is the government. So this is the currently dominant government in Cuba. We know that Castro is on the rise, but these guys are trying to keep power and they have some forces that are going to help them do it. These dark blue cubes are called troops. The light blue cubes are police. And then they also have some bases, but there are no bases currently out. That's why there's a zero here. If you put a base out, you'll see the one. And if you put the other one out, you'll see the two. So this game is designed to make it really easy for you to see what's out there without actually having to hunt it down and count it. We know the total number of forces that the government gets to have. They're currently placed according to that last page of the rulebook for standard setup. We also have information about how to win. So we know that the government's going to win if their support is greater than 18 and all cities have active support for the government. And I'm going to talk about at what point you win shortly. But that's our goal. And as you can see, we're tantalizingly close at the start. It's, uh, it's a little mean, actually, to put, to put the government so close to success and just know that things are going to go wrong uh, because we are currently starting at 16 total support. We need over 18, but we're so close. And things are looking pretty good for us in the cities right now. Maybe we don't have active support, but we control them. And, you know, there's stuff that we can do to get them on our side. So things look tantalizing for the government in the starting setup. One thing that you'll notice, by the way, is that the government's pieces are all cubes. Everybody else's pieces are these little cylinders. And that is because the government is the only faction in this game that doesn't represent some sort of insurgency. We're going to talk about that as we talk about these other factions. So we know that the government wants to have a lot of support, that they want to especially to have support in the cities. And we also can see up here that our current alliance with the United States is strong. So the U.S. is currently going to help us. There's even an aid token on this initial setup tracker underneath our starting resource token. 
So foreign aid, the government, and the syndicate all start at 15 resources on this track. You might have also noticed that active support is specified, but there are places that have passive support or even are neutral. So that's also going to be a major part of this game is pushing these areas to swing back and forth according to our desires as we play. The next faction, which sometimes gets along with the government, as long as the government's helping them make money, is the syndicate. So the syndicate essentially represents organized crime. They're the mob. And so their goal is to have more than seven open casinos out. And they also want to have more than 30 resources. So that's how the syndicate wins. They need money. And that's what they want. They just want to be filthy rich. Y'all government people can do whatever you want. But let us make our money. So we start with three open casinos out on the board. There will be things that can happen to close those casinos, but, you know, hopefully that won't happen. The syndicate also has access to gorillas, which is what these little cylinders are. So when the top of the gorilla piece is blank like this, what that means is the gorilla is undercover. When you flip it over and you see a symbol, so coins in this case for the syndicate, that means that this gorilla is currently exposed and vulnerable. And so whether or not the gorillas are exposed is going to matter during battles over various spaces on the map. The casino also has access to cash, which we're going to talk about later. But essentially, they can put little caches of cash, haha, in various places on the board and then spend them out in order to take extra action. So, you know, they're laundering money and they sometimes spend a little to get a leg up on tempo. Down here in the bottom right corner in red, we've got the 26th of July forces. These are the opposition to the government, which is why their pieces are red and why opposition to the government is also red. So just as you have passive support and active support, you have passive opposition and active opposition. The 26th of July forces are trying to get their opposition plus bases greater than 15. So right now they're starting at seven. It seems like they have a long way to go. But you'd be surprised at how well they can do, no matter how strong the government looks at the start of the game. So like the syndicate, but unlike the government, the 26th of July forces are going to be guerrillas. So again, they have a blank surface for when they're underground and they're in hiding. But there's a star on top if they are exposed. And they also start out with one base on the map. And you can see that because that one is revealed on this space. And then we have the Directorio. So the Directorio is kind of a neutral party that wants to control portions of the population and they want to put bases out, but they're not looking for a support or opposition. They want all these areas of Cuba to be neutral. So when they take over areas, they are going to be pushing this scale towards the middle, towards neutrality. But their goal to win is to get the directorial population. So basically that means in areas they control their little population numbers. They want to get this population plus the number of bases they have out above nine. So they're going to be trying to control various areas on the board and they're going to be trying to get their bases out. And that's how they score. So as you can see, they're not doing super hot right now. They are at one for DR population plus bases on this little score tracker. And that's because the only place they have any control on right now is Kamigwe, um, with one population. So that's where that number comes from. And they, like all the other factions that aren't the government, have gorillas. So we got a star on one side and a blank on the other side. So that is pretty much the setup and the very basics of what everybody wants and where they start. So I want to talk about the general flow of the game because I think that that's what makes coins really special. Uh, and then we're actually going to cut this video because I want to keep things really short and really tight so that you can watch what you need to watch and then you don't get stuck watching things you don't. So I'm going to talk about how to set up the deck and then we're going to do a more detailed map tour and terminology tour in my next video. So I want to set up the deck and then talk about how this influences the flow of the game. So here are our 48 event cards. If you look at them, um, they have little events on them, and they also have symbols for these factions in various orders. I'm about to explain why that is the way it is. But first, I want to actually set the deck up. So again, this is under setup for deck preparation. Just follow those instructions and you'll be fine. But this basically says to separate the four propaganda cards out. These babies are the propaganda cards. As you can see, they say propaganda on them, and they're a different color than everything else. So you should be able to spot them pretty easily, even if your cards are mixed up. But you separate these out. These are really important. Then you shuffle all these other event cards together, which I have already done. So if you want to play a shorter game, then you set eight of these event cards aside. So don't look at them. Just take them out. We don't want to know which events don't come up. And then you're going to split all the remaining event cards into about four piles. So I'm going to do that right now. 
All right, amazing. We've got four piles. Now we're going to take these propaganda cards. Oh, yeah. And we're going to shuffle one propaganda card into each pile. So we'll just lay them out. And then you shuffle these one by one and stack them. So I shuffled pile one. We'll put it here. Pile two has been shuffled. Let's we'll put it here. And then pile three and pile four. So now I have this event deck and I know that roughly evenly throughout this deck, there are four propaganda cards. So what do the propaganda cards do? The propaganda cards trigger a check to see if somebody has won the game. So remember all of those lovely victory conditions that we talked about during our little setup discussion? Propaganda cards are what trigger you to check for that. And if you are holding your victory condition at the propaganda round, then you win the game. There's also a special propaganda round that those trigger that we'll talk about in detail, but we don't need to worry about that just yet. Know that the propaganda rounds trigger a check for victory. And then if nobody wins the fourth propaganda card, which is pretty rare, but it does happen, uh, then there's a way to determine your score and then determine who won that way. So not only do the cards help to determine when you score, the cards in coin are very much the heart of the game and they help to determine how we're gonna use this sequence of play area on the board. So I wanna conclude this video by talking just about the general flow of a coin game, about sort of the, the beating heart of how a coin game works. And that comes from the cards. So for every round of a coin game, you're gonna reveal your current event card and you're gonna reveal the card that is coming up. So you always know what your card for this round is and then what the card for next round will be. So you get to see those events and you also get to see the order of play. So I'm gonna pull this card into the middle so we can have a look at it. So as you look at this card, you can see a cool historical image. There are two different events. So depending on who you are, if you decide to take this card for an event, you're gonna do the event that is the best for you, you know? And you also see all four faction symbols printed in the top. So in this case, we've got the Directorio first, the government, then the syndicate, then the 26th of July. But what makes this very interesting is that even though all four factions are printed on here, that doesn't necessarily determine who's going to play on that turn. And that's because for a given card in a coin game, only two of these factions are going to go. So if you see the card as a round, only two factions ever go per round. And so they have right of first refusal here, but only two of them are going to go. And just because the directorio is first, that doesn't mean that it, they'll actually take this card or take this turn on here. So let me explain a little bit more about how that works. Right now, all of our factions are eligible. And so everybody could go. After people have taken actions on this first turn, that will no longer be true because they're going to be ineligible until the card after the next one. Sometimes it's worth it to forego your turn to either get a really good event or just get first crack on your turn. The other thing that's interesting about this game is that whoever goes first essentially limits in various ways what the second player on a round is able to do. And so that's also going to impact what you, if you're the first player, would like to do because you're deciding what you're opening up for your opponent. And it's also going to impact whether you want to go second on a turn, because for example, even if 26th of July manages to go on this first turn because people pass, they might want to wait and then get first crack at the actions on the next turn because they know they're going to have the first chance to do anything on the following event card. So let's say the Directorio does want to just go first for the game. Let's open it up. So this card is up. They are the first faction printed on the card. That's the active card. Now they have a choice. And their choices are going to affect what whoever plays second can do. So if they do an operation only with no special activity, then the second faction can only do a limited operation. If they take an operation with a special activity, then the second faction is going to be able to do a limited operation or the event on the card. So maybe you leave yourself vulnerable to somebody coming after you and taking that event. Or if you take the event, then the second faction that goes can do basically a full turn of anything that isn't the event. So they can take a full operation and add a special activity. So whatever the directorio does is going to impact what the person after them is able to do. So if the directorio goes ahead and takes the event, that's going to let us march some adjacent spaces and move our gorillas around. That means that if the government decides to come next, they can do a full operation with a special activity. 
Whereas if the directory is just like, well, you know, we'll just do an operation only, then the government's only able to do one limited operation when they go next. But the other thing is that just because the government is next on this card doesn't mean that they have to go. They also have the option to wait for better times and pass. Whenever you pass, you remain eligible for the next round, which is extremely important. And you also get resources. So if you're a little bit broke, you know, you get plus one resource if you are one of the insurgent factions when you pass. You get plus three if you're the government. So maybe sometimes the government would want to pass rather than take kind of a non-ideal action opportunity because that's just more lucrative for them. If that happens, then the next opportunity to play would go to the syndicate. So they would have to decide if they want to take that limited operation or pass. And then the option will go to the 26th of July. So let's say that the government passes, the syndicate decides to go. At the end of this round, this card will be discarded. This one becomes the active card. This card is now revealed as the upcoming card. And these two factions are ineligible to go. Meanwhile, the 26th of July and the government factions are hot to trot on this next card. Come, comrades. So this is partially a game about knowing what your options are and how to take actions to get yourself closer to your goal. But coin games are also very much about timing. They're about knowing when it's worth waiting for the next event card or deciding how much to limit your own actions so that you can limit the person who comes after you. Or maybe you want to risk it all and take a really big action, but you end up giving an opponent a lot, potentially, depending on the rhythm of how things are going. So this card set up with the events is really, I think, the heart of every coin game. And it's what makes them truly interesting. So learning how to time yourself and learning how big of an action to take when you are up first is probably the most difficult to learn and most important skill when you are playing a coin game. I personally am not great at this myself, uh, but I know what I don't know. So I think that's where I'm gonna cut the first video. We talked about the setup, just kind of the general lay of the land here and what it exactly is that everybody's trying to do. So I think what I'm gonna do next is have a video that talks about some general terms in the game, just to make sure that everybody is solid on what we're talking about. We talk about different spaces on the map, what control means, etc. And then I'm going to do one video per faction to show off their actions and what they're able to do. So for now, thank you so much for watching. I'll be back very soon with some more Cuba Libre. And until then, happy gaming.